Hello people. I'm going to read part one of um, Mabon Calling, which is a piece of fiction, kind of excerpts from a novel I'm working on. And um, I'm reading it from the Seneca Journal, um, issue number 117, October 2021. Mabon Calling. Nice illustration there as well, look. Can you see that? Lovely. Okay. Mabon Calling. Um, by Sam Knott. On either side of me are two giant slate tips. And between them the grey sky has just cracked open. Fingers of light trace the contours of distant mounts, while just across the way the heath becomes golden. With quite some delight I notice the slate tips have been shaped by human hands, and it must have been many hands, or else a few pairs over many years, for they are in the form of vast twin dragons, mythical creatures laying upon the earth. And I see they are awake. Their eyes are opened by thorn trees, one in leaf and one in blossom, emerging from eye socket gardens. They seem ready to spring into action, for fires have been left to smoulder in their nostrils. The smoke threads out and in this place, well sheltered from the winds, goes at a pace of its own to join the clouds in the sky. Older than I have ever been, these elements that make me new. Older than I have ever been, these elements that make me new. An excerpt from the Pluropagan pamphlet. Mabonia, which is not what the locals call it, lies at the bottom of a valley beside a great lake. Or at least, we think it is great. After passing through the twin dragons, you descend inside an ancient oak wood eventually picking up the path of a minor but lively river that flows into said lake. You should keep to its line along the spongy, sphagnum-covered rocks that carpet this spellbound little wood, this Pixie's adventure playground that surrounds us in a protective and somewhat multi-dimensional hug. This is a place where all is soft and winding, where dream songs float above the gargle of the river, and you might sleep and laugh and play all around with no fear of coming to human-done harm. Yet, as perhaps there should be in all wild places, there is an edge to this magic, a more than human nature, by which you might find yourself led astray, or spiked, or stung, or maybe your blood will be drunk, or your thoughts flurried. Always to teach you a lesson, mind. Always for a reason. For these are the courts of intuitive fairy justice that seek to uncover the moment you ignored that little voice inside. Or was it? On my way downhill, I pass through a variety of carven archways, each possessing a garlanded face. The faces are quite different in character and mood, yet they all share the curious ability to make me feel like laughing 
at the same time as making me want to be just about as quiet as possible. The birds are singing at a volume I am quite unused to and, though I have been reassured it is safe and that I will be welcomed here, I feel anxious and somewhat alien. I find myself in what appears to be a kind of communal centre. I can hear faint voices and the sounds of pots and pans banging around. There are a variety of structures around me, many of them built right into the earth with only their doors and windows showing. Here in the middle is a circle of shard-like stones pointing up at the sky, with the remains of a fire between. And just over there is a sizeable structure with an elaborately decorated entrance, carved with wonderfully archaic patterns, and with a big conical hat of dried grass on it, reaching nigh to the floor. Something over the river catches my eye, amid ribbons and flags and mirrors and gems all hanging from a tree. Someone appears to be watching me. Suddenly a shadow emerges from behind a building to my right, and I let out the most terrible squeal. This makes the shadow person jump, of course, and to such a degree that I swear I actually see their hair stand on end. I apologise profusely and explain why I am here, and ask if perhaps there is someone who might show me around. This lady's name is Meme, it seems, and she works in the kitchen, and finds my name rather charmingly old-fangled. She shows me an empty hobo, at least I think that's what she calls it, where I might unpack my things and await the initial gathering, scheduled for the following morning. I take the opportunity to sit on a small bench outside the door and relax. As I am doing so, a rather attractive lady walks by, flashes a smile and waves. I decide not to unpack just yet, the more pressing urge being to nip across the river and investigate the shrine I could see under the tree. I am only a few steps into my quest, however, when a wee pixie of a girl wearing a jester's hat and sporting oversized spectacles comes running down the hill behind a sheepdog. Oh, marvellous, I think. A child and a domestic animal. Perfect company. But actually, she seems rather intelligent and self-contained, and the dog gives up pretty quick when I refuse to throw him another stick. Then, all of a sudden, an exceedingly colourful group of ladies is coming down the hill in a bubble of exclamations, and a large fellow with wild grey hair and a big honest grin is advancing towards me with his arms out, wrapping me up in quite the welcome hug. He encourages me to recount the details of my journey. As the story goes on, someone slowly stirs honey into the sun, and in that glorious, sweet light that makes everything soft and dreamy, breathes the first cool black breath of night the spirit steam of falling asleep outside, where the stars are like sparkles of ice in it. I am in a cave, sat where the red-black depths begin to snuggle, my body barely brushed by the farthest edge of the blue-white light that filters in from the opening. I am somehow aware of a single tree that is growing directly above me. I follow the twist and tangle of its roots down through the cracked rock ceiling to where they dangle before me, dripping and cradling the mysterious thing I had been requested to find. It appears to be a glassy sea-green pot, an earth-filled globe that is open at the top, with two small bonsai trees growing in it, 
forked like antlers. The leaves are semi-transparent, as if only half there. I notice that a fire flickers in the yawning mouth of the cave, and that what I took to be walls all around me are in fact other people staring into the fire. They do not appear to be moving, moving, and yet, with each flick of the fire, I find their positions have changed. What a marvellous thing the imagination is! Close my eyes, bang a drum, tell me I'm going to find something, maybe give me a little prompt here and there, and I will journey. Perhaps it will feel more like a succession of self-questionings than actual travel, per se, but certainly I will go somewhere and return with something, something I have been instructed to keep to myself. The witch has said it will make sense to me some day, likely in relation to my current adventures, but maybe even helping me to make sense of other parts of my life. I realise my memory has begun to enshrine the cave, like any other place I've been, and already I am not so sure that I did not, after all, actually happen upon it once upon a time. I watch the thin smoke rising into the great funnel of the roof, joining a sort of fog that collects there. The fellow beside me, who goes by the name of Taro, leans his shaved head in towards mine and tells me in a gentle voice how the energy from the fire goes up through the roof there and connects us to the pole star so that the whole world can be imagined to rotate on that axis. Beside the river, a man is playing guitar to a troop of ducks. His name is Art, and he is the father of the wee pixie girl, Sybil, who I think might be the source of the bright shapes I can see moving slowly through the leaves on the other side. I hover a while, listening to the soft notes mixing with the sound of the water, and then I retire to some distance and realise that here I can probably take out my book and make a true pix without anyone reporting me to Nano State. Yar me hearties! I shall give it a go! I am soon deeply involved in tracing lines, following an intuitive, language-like, yet pre-verbal feeling inside me to transcribe the essence of recent memories. I do so obliquely, often not directly representing the creatures or the scenes involved, but referencing them for myself in an innate idiom, both concrete and abstract at the same time. There is something quite different about this process compared to the depix norm, something more palpable and embodied about it, even though in depix we might be able to transform into line or plane any gesture of which our bodies are capable. There is something about the simplicity of the flatness of the paper before me, the book perched on my knee, the feel of it all, the scrape of the graphite on the slight roughness of the paper. Then, though the voice is a soft one, I am snapped out of my trance. Hey, what you doing? It is art peering over my shoulder. I quickly snap my book shut and hide it in my pocket as the words stumble out of me. Sorry, I'm sorry, I don't know really. I just thought, but then I see that Art is smiling. Don't worry about it, man. It's all pretty soft here. Didn't you see me playing to the ducks? And then it clicks. He was just playing. Just playing for the sheer joy of it. He never waved it ought to see. I want to know more. 
so I hit him with a barrage of questions. It turns out he is indeed a nano-stated muso, and so, admittedly, being past practice, he should be waving all of it ought to see for nano-state to do as they please with. But no one here seems to care about that, so he can get away with just playing if he wants. He tells me he actually really enjoys playing to the ducks, that they make a great audience, and how he trips on the river coming in and out of his attention, actually responding to that in his playing, so that man and river are playing together, and the wind in the trees becomes part of the song too. So I tell him how that reminds me of a poem a way back uncle of mine once wrote, about how the wind in the trees is a river of air, and the current in the river is a kind of wind. And all these natural phenomena transform through each other and us in one big elemental analogy. So they are all different, but not really, and all the same, but not totally. He says it sounds kind of familiar. I feel like I am babbling a bit, but then so is the river, I suppose. We listen to it a while. Of course, here it all goes in Teva, he says, with a hint of some funny old accent. What is Teva? I ask, wide-eyed. He grins at me, and then the cowbell starts to ring, and we head for the hall. Hmm. What? Oh, what? A group is gathered on the lawn near the stone circle. They seem to be clustered around a big bloke in a black and white cowboy shirt and jeans with a red bandana around his neck and somewhat scruffy mad scientist style hair. This must be Doc. He has laid out a bunch of sticks on the grass in a kind of star and is telling anyone who will listen that it is a sign, or sigil perhaps, composed from three capital A's, such that if we look at it a while and let him talk, it might become something of a guiding star for us. Each of the A's stands for a different old word, the first two being ancient Greek ones. He says he's a little rusty so far as the details go, but that we can always go digging around in the sea if it's details we're after. Rather, he would just point out these three little drops, like some kind of oceanic essence, points that might expand into a bigger picture. The first word is aporia, which he says is best summed up as a kind of fertile doubt, a scepticism of sorts, but an open one, not a dismissive one that's already decided that something's nonsense. A genuine drive to question, yet not necessarily seeking closure from the answers, rather seeking always to keep the questioning active, to keep the quest alive. And the second word, which he admits sounds a bit like a disease, and apparently some people think it is one, is apophenia. Or at least he thinks it's something like that. Anyway, it is all about making connections between things, even things that are not necessarily related. But then he asks, what does it mean to be related or not? He reckons it is all about the human tendency to see patterns. And so he says, where the first A is maybe about science, this A is probably more about magic. And then the third word is an old one from a language he says 
Some still speak around here. Oh, when? Apparently, it is a word for inspiration, for the creative sparks or energy behind poetry and stuff. So this last day is all about art, and he says we will hear plenty more about it in the rest of our time here, as apparently Sailor, the big grey-haired guy who hugged me hello, is going to tell a story about it in the roundhouse tonight. It's evening now, and I'm sat on a bench inside the roundhouse, just to the left of the door. We are all waiting for Sailor to arrive. The fire is burning low in the centre, and there are two guys sat to the left of me, talking quite rambunctiously and laughing a lot. One of them keeps going on about making holograms of people and saying stuff about the fifth dimension, while the other one is trying to hold on to the thread of a story about how a friend of his who was, oh hang on a minute, he has turned to me and offered a glow. I have experimented with such things a little bit, and like most people I quite like to glow, so I take it off him and fiddle around with it, albeit lacking the finesse he so nonchalantly displayed. He tells me I'm pretty good with it, and I thank him, telling him I have not had much practice, and asking him what his name is and what he nano states. He tells me his name is Q, but then his friend jumps in and tells me that Q would never nanostate a thing, but that actually he is something of an expert in phenomenon, 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 phenomenology, Q finishes coolly. His friend, whose name is Zap, tells me that phenomenon, phenomenon, that it's basically a really interesting 20th century philosophical movement that eventually unfolded into quite a sophisticated psychology, like a kind of remixed Zen Buddhism for academics, and that it was instrumental in, yes, I tell him, I've groked it a bit and I think it's pretty cool. It's hard to believe there was once a time when subjective experience was not considered a viable area of scientific study. I chuck him the glow, and he does this neat little finger dance thing and winks at me. I see him glance over my shoulder and turn to see Sailor filling up the doorway, pulling himself in under the low beam, stepping into the room and then extending. He is pretty tall anyway, but with us all sat down, and maybe the fact I am glowing too, well, he looks like an actual giant. He introduces himself in the natural quiet that has descended, making sure we have all been welcomed and are feeling good, and then he asks if we would like to hear an old story that used to be told round these parts. Doc says no, and we laugh, and Sailor shuffles closer to the fire. He stands a bit like he sounds, with his feet a little wider than his shoulders, and his knees springy, and his arms held from his side so that his hands are free to emphasise his words. Sometimes it looks like he is tilting backwards, staring off into an imaginary sky. But right now, he is looking down into the fire, and he begins to tell. A long time ago, there was a young boy, and his name was Taliesin, which means shining brow. I guess... He had a brilliant mind or something, rather than just a sweaty forehead. His mother was a great goddess, the great witch Keridwin, 
and she had a cauldron as big as the world. Maybe it even was the world. I don't know. Anyway, she was making a potion in this cauldron. A magical potion to give to her other son, Taliesin's brother, who was something of a dimwit. In fact, he was utterly stupid. Keridwin made Taliesin help her in this task. It was his job to stir the cauldron. And the recipe demanded that he stir it for a year and a day. A year and a day. And so all day, every day, all the year long, Taliesin toiled at the cauldron, stirring the medicine that would help make his brother clever. And then, on the last day, perhaps Taliesin was getting tired by now. I expect so. On the last day, Taliesin accidentally dropped his stirring stick into the cauldron and three drops of the searing hot liquid jumped out and burnt his finger. Without stopping to think about it, he jammed his finger into his mouth and sucked, sucked the three drops down. Now, it just so happened to be the case that only those first three drops were any good at all. The rest of the potion was useless, poisonous, in fact. And so when Keridwin saw what had happened, she became so angry that Taliesin feared for his very life. But his life had become something else. Charged up by those three magical drops, he was a shining golden god boy. He turned and ran from Keridwin and she gave chase. He used his magic to turn into a hare, but she became a hound and ran him down. He managed to reach a river and he leapt in, changing into a salmon and swimming away, but she became an otter and went after him. And when she was nearly upon him, he threw himself out of the river and went into the sky as a white dove. But she became a hawk and swooped on him. He folded his wings and fell to the earth like a stone, straight into a wheat field, and there became a single grain, thinking himself well hidden. But soon it was harvest time, and he was cut down, and Keridwin became a chicken, and she scratched all through the great pile until she found the grain that was him and she swallowed him whole. But Taliesin did not die. Oh no. He grew inside her until he was ready to be born again. And when she gave birth to him this time, she saw he had a beauty all his own, and she could not bear to kill him. She set him in a small round boat, a coracle, they call him, and set him floating upon the sea. Now, a little way down the coast, and this is a place I know well, there lived a king whose sons could never please him. No matter how hard they tried to prove themselves, whatever they tried to do, he would never praise them, not a bit. Well, this place was known for its salmon, there was a special bay there where the salmon used to gather. And so one of the sons went down to the bay at the right time of year, thinking he had a way to gather up so many salmon that his father could not help but be impressed. But again and again he cast his net into the water and brought it back empty. Until, just when he was about to give up, he saw he had caught something. Of course, it was Taliesin in his little round boat. The king's son was distraught, saying he would never impress his father now. But the young Taliesin spoke up. Not so, said he, for you have netted a poet. A poet is of more value than any amount of fish, more valuable even than gold. 
The king's son was so impressed by the confidence of this fair youth, and so impressed that he could speak so eloquently while being still so young, that he believed in his promise, and thus brought him before the king. What in the hell is this? said the king. I was expecting a boatload of salmon, and you bring me this puny little boy instead. What use is he to me? And so Taliesin spoke up again. He stood proud before the king and said firmly, Perhaps if you could manage to stop enjoying the sound of your own voice quite so much, you would find that I can speak far better than you can question. And the king was so impressed at this retort that he bade him go ahead and say more. And so Taliesin spoke again. And these are the words that he said. I am Taliesin, and I will spit metre and rhyme that last until the end of time. I know why. As Sailor recites Taliesin's increasingly quixotic knowledge claims, I realise there are tears in my eyes and such an energy in my body that I will need to get up and do something with it. The story has impacted me profoundly and in the most marvellous but mysterious of ways. I feel like something has been spoken straight into my heart from the distant past. Something in me is reassured and some sleeping part of me appears to have woken. I join in the raucous applause and playful whooping as Sailor takes a bow, but I am glowing too hard to stay sitting down any longer, so I leave the blood-honey warmth of the roundhouse and emerge into a crystalline, star-studded night. I stand there a while stretching, then just watching my breath disappear into the sky, until I notice two glowing traces winding toward me in a sort of fluid fire script, like strange words painted in the night with a glowing face behind. As this vision approaches me, the wowed mouth coming towards me, the wild eyes winding as they follow the glow in the dancing fingers, I hear a sound, a strange throaty sound that seems to breathe in and out at the same time, an eow, 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 like some kind of high-tech insectoid throat massage. And now the eyes are meeting mine, and I morph from gobsmacked to reflect the grin that is in them. The noise stops and the hands drop and with perverse glee the fellow pronounces, as if by way of explaining himself, De monkeys! De monkeys! And then he starts up his sounds again and turns and wanders back into the night. Zap comes and puts a hand on my shoulder. I see you've met Goat and I laugh. I guess so. Zap snaps his fingers to make his glow bloom quickly to life, waving it temptingly before my face. But I feel a pleasant fatigue and decide to ride it off to sleep. As I climb the hill back towards Hoboam, the knifeful moon comes into view behind the trees, and I blow my dear Pinu a kiss. Blessed be, and thanks for glistening, good people. See you next time. <laughs>